Super uh, excited to be here this morning. My name is Jono. I'm the program director up at Thousand Pines Christian Camp, which is just right up there. Um, and yeah, really, uh, really excited. Uh, for the last couple of years, been involved in different ways with First Baptist Church. Uh, one of the things I get to do up there is oversee our internship program called Caneo, um, and which actually well represented I didn't even know they were coming today. That's great. Um, almost the whole crew is here. That's great. Um, but yeah, I get to oversee that program up there, which is awesome. Uh, I've been doing that now for a little over two years. And uh, Bill, Pastor Bill, invited me to come at, while he was out and uh, come and share with you. Um, so I'm excited. It's always fun to get to come and um, speak and share just uh, what God's been putting on, on my heart and um, hopefully uh, yeah, he'll speak to you through his word today. So uh, let me pray for us to get us started, and then uh, we'll jump in here. God, I thank you for a, another day, Lord, uh, for, for how obvious it, it is just to look outside and look around and see, God, your beauty, your creation, that it speaks of you, Lord, and I thank you for that, God, that... Um, no matter what is going on around us, Lord, or in our lives, God, that your mercies are new every morning, God, and, and great is your faithfulness. So, Lord, I just pray, God, that as we um, spend a few moments studying your word, uh, looking at it, and, and applying it to our lives, Father, I pray that you would give us wisdom, Lord, that you would speak through me. God, that it would not be my words, uh, but yours. Lord, that the things that are of me, God, would just uh, would burn away quickly. Lord, we want to be transformed by you. So we just give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Mm. All right. Um, so this morning, uh, we're going to talk about a topic that has been really... Um, I guess at the forefront of my mind and, and of a lot of my conversations lately, and you're going to, you got to hear me out on this because it sounds a little bit of a downer and actually sounds a little bit, well, depressing, <laughs> but it's good. Um, I've been thinking a lot about death lately, and no, not because I'm attacked by spiders in the middle of the night, uh, but I, I don't know, I, I don't know if it's just because... Um, you know, I'm a little deeper into my 30s now, or um, it, maybe it's because uh, I, I, we, I, we have one, my, my wife and I have been married in November, it'll be 10 years, and we have, um, we have one little girl, uh, we'd like to have more kids, uh, we're actually in the process of becoming foster parents, we love the idea, we, we're, we're really excited about it, but right now we have one, one child God's blessed us with, and she'll be two in November. Um, and I don't know, I, I find myself thinking about the checkpoints, right? I, I, I'm totally that, you know, sappy dad that when, when she wouldn't sleep at night, you know, I'd hold her in my arms and watching, you know, the sunrise, um, those early days. And uh, one of the things that would get her to sleep is I'd kind of spin around with her and dance. And uh, I just, you know, your mind automatically goes to that, gosh, what? What day, what's that going to be like, you know, that day when, when you get to have that father-daughter dance, you know, when, what's that going to be like, Where, what will life look like, you know, at that point, um, you know, I, I, these little moments that our family, we get to have are just these precious little gems, but what's interesting is then all around us, all around us, there's death, it's everywhere, there's suffering, there's pain, there's hurt, there's sorrow. I mean, even just in this room, I, I, gosh, we could, <laughs> we could go around and I'm sure the stories that we could share of, of pain and, and death. And, and so I've been thinking about it more and, and just processing through. And 
When I was preparing for this, for this talk and I was preparing for this time when, when Bill asked me to come and share, I, you know, it's, it's so fascinating. It's interesting as a speaker, as a, as a pastor, the, the times where you just share it and you know it's just going to be one, one message. You think, okay, Lord, what do you, what do you want to say? What, what do we, what, this kind of go for it. <laughs> uh, this, this is what came to mind and um, this idea of not wasting our life, not wasting it. I, again, I don't know if it's just, as I'm getting older and that sort of thing, and, and just really taking stock and being able to look back, you know, looking back at 10 years of marriage, which for a lot of you in here is just getting started, and that's great. <laughs> for me, I know it's like, oh, this is cool. This is 10 years. My parents just celebrated, gosh, I think they've been married now 45 years. They got married very young. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, it's, you start taking stock of things. And I was reminded of this story. So my, my parents, they live in Africa, Tanzania, East Africa. They've been there for about 14 years now. And they run a ministry called Hope of the Nations. They started that uh, about 13, 14 years ago. And um, they're out there full time. So they come back about, I get to see them uh, maybe once a year, um, sometimes twice a year. But um, so they're out there. And, and so I've been privileged. I've gotten to go out and visit them over the years. And on one particular trip, um, we were, they were first just getting the ministry started. And so it, everything was new. Everything was, we're, we're go going out and reaching these villages and finding places where literally the gospel has never been shared before. So really exciting stuff. So uh, I put t a team together on stateside uh, from a college that I was teaching at. And we said, we're going and we're going to come and preach the gospel. It's going to be great. So we prepare, you know, we go through the training and stuff like that. And we get there and uh, we're doing some local stuff right in the, in the area where they were at. And it's very um, rural. It's about the, the city that they live in is about the size of Crestline. Um, and there's one paved street down the middle. And it's, you know, houses, Western style houses, but just beyond that is it gets into what we would know maybe from National Geographic that, you know, the mud houses and the thatched roofs and very, very, um, you know, you, you're going back to, you know, time long, long time ago. So uh, we're, we're preparing and now it's time for us to go out to the village. We're going, we're going out. And so we get all of our gear together and you're, we're going to, you know, there's no there's no water, no running water, there's no electricity, there's no, no you're, we're just going out there. And so the only way to travel is along this lake called Lake Tanganyika. It's the longest lake in the world and one of the deepest as well. Um, and the, the, you just get on these boats and you start going. And so at the time, they, they have their own boat now, but they didn't at the time. So we had to rely on public transportation and <laughs> holy smokes. Holy smokes, we ha I had no idea what I was getting into. I thought, you know, I'm, I was a younger guy and we're going to do this and we're going to come in and it's going to be great. We're going to make a change. And then I see the boat. <laughs> I, I saw it in a distance at first and we're on the shore and we got all our stuff and our gear. And I see this thing floating out there. <laughs> uh, okay, no, it's an adventure. It's going to be great. We gather our gear and they had these uh, long uh, canoes that were all carved out, um, just hand carved canoes that we had to load up on to go out to the other boat. So we get all our stuff on and we get out there, water splashing us, we're all woohoo, high five and isn't this great and this is so fun, we're in Africa and we're doing it man and there's literally like crocodiles like down over there we're like ha ha, isn't that funny, this is awesome. Um, no clue, no clue what was about to happen. <laughs> we get to this boat and it's the first stop, this is the, the port city that we were in in Kigoma, we were going out just out and so it was completely empty at the time and the boat was roughly the size if 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 one end was here the other end would be right about maybe where that first car is parked right there that's about the size of this boat but it's essentially just a giant canoe just a massive canoe. there's no seats <laughs> there's no nothing it's just a big when you stood in the middle I could jump and touch the first uh, crossbeam so it would be like, so you're, 
like a boat that's in the process of being built, <laughs> not quite done yet. Hey, let's use it. It, it floats. Let's go. Mostly floats. Um, so it's this giant boat. So we start just throwing our stuff in. And, and then we start looking, and there's people loading their goats in, loading their chickens in. And I'm like, oh, this is awesome. That we're doing it. This is so great. So we get in, and we start looking around like, OK, where do we go? <laughs> like, we're, so uh, do we have a tip? Like, what, what seat number? Are we? No, no, no. There's, there's none of that. It's uh, every man for themselves. You start claiming your territory and staking your, you know, this is my area. So we all sort of migrate to the front and along the edges. Now, it's about, it's about oh, maybe 8 o'clock at night by the time we get all on. So the sun's just going down, and we head out. Now, the lake is so big. When you, when you stand on the edge, you look out, you can barely see the cliffs of Congo, barely. It's essentially like being in the ocean. So we set out just straight out into the darkness. They don't, they don't have any equipment. They don't, they don't have any radar. They barely had, there's one guy in the front that has a flashlight. <laughs> that's their, that's their, you know, their equipment. So we head out, and I'm sitting there on this. We finally get in. I'm the team leader. I'm supposed to be in charge, and I'm supposed to, you know, have the, attitude, the great attitude and everything. I'm sitting on the front of the boat, and I just have this moment of like, what are we doing? And this boat just starts, with every wave, because it's, I mean, it's massive, and the, the water starts to get a little choppy, and I start looking back, and the little light that already was there is gone, gone. I'm like, there's no life jackets? There's no, what, what? I just, I have this panic, this absolute panic. So it was an 18-hour boat ride, 18 hours with no outside contact whatsoever. If anything went down, th that was it. There was, there was no, about every half an hour, I would yell out to some team members on our team that were laying on a platform about this big, uh, right over the edge to where it was, about, it was about a 12 foot drop to the water. But if anyone went in, that was it. There was no life jackets, there was no safety nets, there was no safety boat, nothing. So I'm like, oh Lord, oh Lord. <laughs> Please, Father, like have, oh, we got to get through this. And you start getting into survival mode <laughs> to where now there's like, woohoo, high fives turn into these like elbowing the guy next to you because this was my space and I was here first. And oh, you start getting very animalistic around like hour 12 um, where these cute little friendly goats, they're, start, they're peeing and pooping everywhere. And it just, the, the smell just starts mixing with all the other smells because there aren't any other bathrooms either. And so you can kind of let your imagination run with that one. Um, <laughs> it was terrible terrible. People was getting seasick, just throwing up all over. The, it was terrible to the point to where the people were going to reach and connect with. I just despised it. I despised the whole thing. I was like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go home. I have a team I'm responsible for. We're probably all going to die. This was a terrible, terrible idea. 18 hours later, the sun came up, and we, you know, we made it through the night, only to realize we had another six hours to go. The heat just starts heating everything. I'm like, this is it. This is, this is how we die. <laughs> this is how we go. Every, every hour or so, we would pick up more people, but not drop anyone off. <laughs> it was so full. It was so packed. Every, I'm no, no exaggeration, every square inch of this space was taken to where it, was, it got, it, yeah, you, you have people that you don't know that you, you, you wake up and are now spooning, uh, but you don't care anymore because you think, I'm probably going to die anyway, so you know what, this is how I go. I mean, it got, it got desperate times. Uh, we, we finally get to where we're going. We finally get to this village. It is so far. There are no roads. There are no, to the point to where um, 
when we, when we got our stuff and we just scramble and are just kind of spewed onto, onto dry land, people, kids were running up to us and either were terrified of us because they'd never seen a white person before or thought we were somehow, you know, they, they, they didn't know who we were. I had kids running up and rubbing my skin and laughing because they thought I had paint on me. They wanted, they're trying to wash it off. They thought it was the funniest thing. Just delirious, felt sick, felt tired, wanted to quit. What am I doing here? We show up to this celebration. I, I imagine it was somewhat like Jesus' day. They had palm fronds. And they were waving them back and forth, celebrating that people had come to share the good news celebrating that people had come to teach the Bible because they didn't have one. Most of, there wasn't a, an actual Bible there. They had heard about things. Different people had come uh, from other villages sharing bits and pieces of the truth, but they were so excited. And so you show up and you're really trying to have a good attitude. <laughs> you're really trying to, and it, you just have this feeling of, can I just, I just need a minute. <laughs> I, can I take a nap or take? They ushered us in and said, we're ready for you. We've been waiting. Okay, we're, let's, let's do this. <laughs> I walk in, so there, there are just hordes of people, crowds of people cheering and waving and celebrating and singing. And they usher me in to this room that's about, the, it would be about the size of this space here, all mud, you know, mud bricks and they said okay we're ready for you to teach oh, okay <laughs> awesome <laughs> i've been awake for eight, you know 20 plus hours at that point you know thrown up i don't know how many times like been thrown up on how many times i don't know i okay all right let's do it so i pull out my bible and uh i felt like god was leading me to teach on uh relationships and specifically, um, husband and wife relationship. Uh, and so I started teaching. Right in the front row, there was, there, was, there was this couple. She was nine months pregnant, and, and it was their first. And they were just so excited to be there, sitting front row. They had this tiny little piece of, I couldn't tell what it was, just a torn off piece of paper off of something, the one piece of paper they could scrounge up, and a golf pencil about that size, just a little nub, something we would all just throw away. And that's, he, the gentleman was here, and he was sitting, just the young guy, ready to take notes, ready to write stuff down, which was a really big deal that he could actually um, write. Um, sit in front row, just hanging on every word, just... Oh, yeah, and I'm going through different things of scripture. I, I wrap up, we go, and we <laughs> crash, fall asleep. That night, um, I wake up, we're, we're sleeping in these tents, and uh, I wake up to hearing screaming, just screaming, the type of scream, if you've ever heard, that just rocks you to your core. and. You, know, you wake up, what is, what's going on, what's going on? You kind of panic, like, everywhere. you hear that? Okay. We go outside, we go outside our tent area. We go, I go over to this little tiny, teeny tiny little shack, and there's people outside sort of pacing, and there's people coming in and out, and there's just screaming and screaming and screaming. And we're trying, we're trying to figure out what's going on, and we find out that uh, it was the woman that was sitting, the young gal that was pregnant, she was going into labor. And, uh, you know, very, very, very uh, rural. There's no doctors. There's no nurses. There's no midwives. There's no clinic. There's no call-in, you know, help. None of that. A lot of the practices that they have there are very um, old, ancient practices that are just, ap if, when you would hear the things that they would do, it just blows your mind that, how, like, how have they not been told or been helped in different ways in medical practices and things? Anyway, I'm standing there, and the screaming goes from this 10 to a 0, to nothing, it's absolute silence. And I'm, what's going on? What's going on? We're trying to, you know, is there anything we can do? I, I'm not trained. At, I wasn't trained at the time in any kind of medical 
field or any way, and, I, and there's this, this moment, and then people started coming out, one by one coming out, and I saw the pastor, and he's just weeping, weeping and weeping. They had a small church that was there, that's who we were teaming up with, and, and the pastor was in there, and so he comes out and just absolutely broken. And so everybody goes their way, and we, we all go back to sleep. And the next morning, I get up, and I, start, and I, I find the pastor, and I said, what? what happened? And they said, the baby didn't make it, and she didn't make it. They both died. And I just, whew, man, it, talk about <laughs> the things of I'm tired, or I feel uncomfortable, or I'm hungry, or I'm, talk about perspective, Right? Now, I went on a walk. It was one of the, I'll never forget this. I got, I, the, the pastor, myself, um, we went on, went on a walk. He called himself Oscar. That was his sort of name that we could all pronounce. Um, <laughs> pastor Oscar and I, we went on a walk, and he said, uh, I, I just started asking him, like, what, like, what can we, how can we help, what, what can we do, how, and he just had this sense of hope. And I'd, I, you know, I'd never been that, I guess, at the time, that close to death before in that way. And he just had this sense of hope that I had never experienced before. And I'll never forget that we got to this point, it was overlooking the lake, and in, in his broken English, all he could say was to live as Christ and to die as gain. Death is everywhere. I, I just, we just wept together. I, I couldn't, it had never been more real to me than in that moment to live as Christ and to all, the, all the, the things of my American, Western, everything must be convenient, everything must be comfortable, everything must be now, just didn't matter anymore. <laughs> Something clicked for me in that moment. I want us to look just for a couple of minutes at these verses that Paul writes. If you have a Bible, open up to, to Philippians chapter one. That happened about, oh, 10 or, no, more than that. Maybe yeah, about 10 years ago. Uh, and I've been on this, this journey um, really trying to discover what it looks like to be a Christian, right? I mean, I grew up, I grew up in a Christian family. I grew up, my dad was a pastor. I was the first one there and often forgot, and they would have to come back, oh, that's right, we, I was third born, and so I was just so comfortable being at church and doing all the events and doing all the things, and so being around the things of God my whole life, right? And so Something, though, about being around the things of God, you can almost get complacent. You can, you can get to this point of, yeah, yeah, I know that one. Yeah, Daniel, lion's den, yep, close the mouth, boom, yay, one's the snack, right? Uh, <laughs> we can get to those points to where the things, the, the incredible things of God just be, kind of become second nature. Ah, yeah, I know that story. Yeah, yeah, let's move on. Um, but when, when it becomes real, when, we, when we, we begin to see God not just as, as our Savior and we, we know him, oh, okay, I get to go to heaven, but when, when we begin to see him as our Lord and we begin to follow him and surrender to him in obedience, man, that's where our faith really comes alive. That's when our walk with the Lord really comes alive. And for Paul, he wrote this um, around 61 AD and uh, Paul planted the church in Philippi. He, he knew these people. Well, he, he's the author of this, of this letter. Um, he went on different missionary uh, journeys and, and uh, church planting and sharing the gospel. And one of the places he stopped was Philippi. And, and when he planted this church, uh, he handed it off to a group of leaders and then kept going. And so now this is a letter writing back to them to encourage uh, to, to help guide and ultimately bring them together in unity. There were some things happening, coming up, as they do, uh, in, in church uh, experience and in life together. And so he's writing this letter to them to encourage them. But he's in a very real and very raw place in his life. He's in house arrest. 
He, he's at a point in life where he, he's waiting a verdict that is, it is almost undoubtedly going to, to end in his execution. There's this point, he's at this point in his life where the things that used to be maybe so important or not as important, just it's become very clear to him. And he writes in such a way, 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 I think to us, starting in verse 19. He says this, For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and through the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also, Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. And then verse 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Let's pause there. Paul is painting this picture of literally being torn, actually being torn between two things. You ever been torn between two things? That, oh, but I I could do this, but oh, but this. You know, the process of choosing a school, choosing a a job, choosing a, um, I don't know, fill in the blank. You you have these moments in life where, where you're just torn. You're like, oh, man, this but this would be so much better. But uh, there's this, this tearing that Paul's talking about and something that uh, in our culture, in our uh, Western culture, is, is really hard to fathom, hard to, to grasp. Because what he's talking about is being torn between life and death. What? <laughs> that literally goes against everything we know what it means to be an American. It goes against everything. Stay younger longer. <laughs> Stay healthier longer. Be, be, have all of the things you could ever want now. We're a, we're a microwave culture, right? We, this, I want it, and I want it right now. And I need it, and I, I have to have it, and I'll take it, and I'll do whatever I can to get it. And we do everything we possibly can to avoid anything that would be any close to death at all. I was driving in Riverside the other, uh, yesterday, and I thought it was fascinating uh, because I was driving past uh, off of, um, oh, what is that? Anyway, I was driving down, I passed the cemetery down there, and uh, I thought it was fascinating. A lot of cemeteries, um, uh, Years ago, I can't remember who the guy was, but I remember reading an article about it, how he came up with the idea to get rid of headstones and move it to flat stones so that it didn't look like a cemetery. It looked like a garden because it didn't want to be reminded of death. At a cemetery! Like, what? Like, we're so good at trying to shuffle and hide. Don't talk about it. Don't think about it. It's because this is all we have if we don't have Christ. This is it. This is as good as it's going to get. So let's do everything to claw and hold on to and protect and keep to be torn between life and death. To literally be torn. I think of that moment with my daughter. Gosh. Getting to be there and walk her down the aisle someday. Maybe but maybe not. Am I so attached, good things, attached to the things of this world? God, please don't, not yet. I'm not, don't come yet. You ever prayed that? God, no, I'm not, no, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I, I need to do this thing. I need to have this thing happen first. I need to, please, God, don't, don't come, don't. Where does that fit? into this. Man, I've been so challenged by this, you guys. I've been so convicted, honestly, in areas of my life where I've been desperately clinging to the things of this life 
that I haven't been able to say, death is gain. As long as I'm alive, it's for Christ, and dying is an upgrade. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I don't think we have to wait to the end of our lives to be able to say that. We don't have to wait until we've done all the things, we've seen all the things, we've tried all the things, and now, God, just please, just now, now I'm ready, take me in my sleep, and... Uh, and then I'll be with you. Is that it? Is that it? There's gotta be more. There has to be more. To live as Christ, what does that mean? To live as Christ means to have him as our central focus. In all of our decisions, so much of Christian walk gets so wrapped in, God, what is your will? I don't know. Maybe is it this, is it not? I wanna be out of your will. Am I? I'm gonna go, Aah. Look around, oh, I'm still alive. Sometimes that's how we make decisions because we're so worried about being in and God's will, not being in God's will. Oh, should I do this? We get so wrapped up with these details, we miss it. We miss the fact that as long as I'm alive, it's for Christ. What is that? It means to bring him glory. What does it mean to bring Christ glory? What does it mean to bring God glory? Make him look good. <laughs> make God look good. That's it. That's as simple as we can get when it comes to our call. Make them look good. How do you do that? Well, walking around in defeat. Walking around uh, in, 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 with, without joy. Walk, going through life absolutely worried about every single decision, every single thing that may or may not happen. Does that bring glory to God? A savior? One that provides? One that, that, that sees everything and holds everything in his hand? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think we miss it at times. I, me, I know I miss that at times. Where, when, when my life is so consumed about meaningless things, I'm not bringing glory to God. I'm not living for Christ primarily. And so the question is, what are we living for? What is most important in our life? Is it the things that have, when you take stock, do they have any eternal value at all? The things we're, that we find ourselves thinking about, the last thing we think about before we go to sleep, the first thing we think about when we wake up, tells a lot about a person. The things that we, that we find ourselves worrying about. You know, in that moment when... when uh, when a pastor in Africa shared uh, this verse with me, it, it did start me on this journey. And this is where I want to end. First uh, Peter chapter three. Flip over there. The difference is this. The, the difference that I've been discovering is this: is that as a follower of Christ, we have a hope that the world does not have, that has, knows nothing about. Like I said, I grew up in the church. I grew up around the things of God. And so I just, I've been, become comfortable and accustomed to having this hope. Even to the point to where I've often struggled just completely taking it for granted. Anybody else been there? <laughs> you get, you know, you memorize the verses. You go to the things. You're a part of the deals. You, you show up and you just get used to having this, this hope that the world knows nothing about. In, in First Peter, it's very similar to when, when Paul is writing in Philippians, uh, the church is going through a time of persecution. They're going through this time of trial. They're, go, they're, they're literally physically, be, it's, they're on this, this cusp of pretty big wave of persecution. People are, a lot of people are going to die. They're about to, to be killed for their faith. Right now, what they're experiencing a lot of in, in the work environment, they're being treated differently as Christians, being ostracized, being looked down, being, and, and, and it's starting to ramp up. And so this, this letter is written to a church that is really in the thick of it. And what I love here in chapter three, he goes through and he's painting this picture of how to live in a world as a Christian like that. He gets to this, this, this turning point in chapter three. He says this, um, but even in chapter three, verse 14 of 1 Peter, he says this, he says, um, 
But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed, and do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Verse 15, but sanctify or set apart the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Ask yourself this question. I, I ask myself this all the time. It's a little thing that I'll do. When was the last time someone just had to know, they had to know so much so that they'd be willing to go up and say, Can, what? you just seem to have this hope in the middle of all of this craziness. Like, not that you're spared from it somehow. You're in it. You're in the thick of it. And somehow... You just have this, what is that? Can, when was the last time someone came to you and asked you that? When was the last time someone came to me, a family member, a coworker? Or do we blend in? Do we just look like everybody else going through struggles, going just, I'm just trying to make it through. I'm just trying my best to keep my head up. I'm just really trying. Is that... Is that the hope? Have we missed that hope? To be ready to give a defense for the hope that you have means that you are living your life in such a way that gives glory to God because you are convinced this is not it. This isn't it. I am but a pilgrim passing through. No matter what gets thrown at me, no matter what happens to my body physically, no matter what happens if I were to die today, I'm convinced of the hope that I have in Jesus. I don't have to be weighed down, bogged down, head down, just trying to make it through. Is it going to be hard? Absolutely it's hard, of course, but this isn't it. This isn't it. To live is for Christ, but to die is gain. It's gain. If you're sitting here right now, this was a challenge that was given to me a while ago. If, if you're sitting in this room now and, and to just be honest with yourself, can I, can I really say that with, with confidence and believe it? If not, gosh, spend time with the Lord. Spend time with God saying, God, would you help me see that perspective? in everything, that eternal perspective. Help me to, to realize that this is not it. Help me to see areas where I am not, I don't have any, I'm not putting you first. I, I'm seeing where I, I want to hold on to this life. For young guys in here, man, I, I remember those thoughts. Man, I can't, God, don't come back before I get to get married. <laughs> Don't come back before I get to have kids. Don't come back, you, you know, the list goes. But to truly be in a place where God, whatever you want, as long as I'm alive, it's for you. And when I die, it's an upgrade. <laughs> that perspective, that we would hold that. That's my prayer for us this morning. The last thing is this. I've said that before, and so it's a typical preacher. Uh, but this really is. <laughs> if you don't know that hope, if, you, if you're sitting here this morning and you're like, yeah, I've been around the things of God. I kind of know about, maybe it's been some, some sort of like a, a club experience, you know, where you, you show up and everything's good. It's kind of like a reprieve or, you know, a space to just belong. But if, which are, are not bad things or good things, but, but if, if you've never truly surrendered to God. You see, if you find yourself being overwhelmed by fear, fear of death, fear of the unknown, anxiety, you find yourself being overwhelmed by those things, my challenge is that you would surrender. Do it today. It's simple. Saying, God, I want to surrender my life to you. Not just in some get out of jail free card, not go to hell card, or just make sure I get to go to heaven card. Gosh, we, we miss so much of it if that's our perspective. To say, God, I want to surrender you to you in everything. 
everything, that the things of this world that are just so meaningless would have that perspective. Let's pray. God, thank you so much, Lord, that you, you've given us your word that, uh, that we can, can use that as our standard, as our foundation in all of life. Lord, even as we just read, Lord, it, it, with pause, as he came to this point with you of realizing that whether by life or by death, he wanted to give you glory. Oh, Lord, I, I pray for that for myself, God. I pray that you would help me to have that perspective. I pray for each one of us in here, God, that we would come to a point of just being sick of the things that the world has to offer, no longer um, swayed by what the world would have for us and saying to, to chase after this or that, God, but that we would be so willing to surrender to you. God, that's my prayer, Lord. I pray that if there's anyone in here today that hasn't done that, that hasn't truly said, I don't want you to just be uh, a, a, my savior, but I want you to be my Lord, to have that command over my life. God, I pray that you would stir in your spirit, that you would stir that up, Lord, that there would be a response today. We love you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen.